I'm Lonnie Bradley Holly, senior and African American artist, and I'm from. Uh, well, I was born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama. My, uh, I'm living in Atlanta, Georgia, United States of America. And I'm here on the behalf of a wonderful exhibit that has been brought with a collection of art and the interests of artists from the southern region of the United States of America. And the exhibit to me is talking about walking, marching. The exhibit is actually portraying the foot soldiers uh, from babies to death. And I'm here doing a workshop with some of the students. And the students are college students. And they've done a wonderful job just listening and just uh, paying attention to my ways of demonstrating with the materials that was at hand. It's been wonderful to just go around Margate and a little bit, of maybe maybe 20 minutes out. If you look at the perimeter of Margate, 20 minutes away from here to a place called the Junk Sale, and we collected some material there and from some of the antique and what we call them flea market kind of stores in the inner city. We selected materials for me to work with. And also I shared some of those materials with the students, plus we uh, went into some hardware stores and we bought some other products that could be in, weaved into their works. And uh, I found the experience to be so very, very rewarding because of having always at my back or either in front of me, what you all call the sea, I call it the ocean, because if we rise up from here and we looked outward, it'd end up going on out into the ocean. Uh, it's fascinating to see the transitioning of the cloud mass that's Mr. Turner, the person that the museum is named after, he was an artist. What was his inspiration? This is the Turner Museum. And I really see how we are as humans like any other game player. Sometimes we are running in a race and we need somebody else to take our place because we be done ran and ran and ran until we can't hardly run anymore and then we pass the torch to somebody else. I think that's what Mr. Turner have done with his arts. He showed the environments of the times. He, he showed our, the cloud mass of the times versus what we see today, even today, as a beautiful day it is, I don't see any clouds, but I still see the haze that rides the ocean. I see uh, almost a fog that is between the shipping lanes. I'm seeing so much of what the students might have seen when I first demonstrated is necessary to even work with the particles. It's necessary to work with the smallest degree of materials that we can think of because they end up in our ocean. They end up in our seas, rivers, creeks and ditches, and on and on. That was a lot. <laughs> it was great. Uh, for me as a teacher, 
how do I feel coming before students? First of all, I always want to shine the light on how I really got to be who I am, who gave me the chance to express myself as a human with a brain like I have, acquisitive brain, I, I say, I'm thinking curious about all materials that I'd be involved with. Or uh, to share that curiosity or to enhance other people's curiosity to the point that they can appreciate it, I have to uh, always look back on how it came to be my chance to be a teacher. And I have to give that credit to someone as great as Mr. William Arnett. Uh, his name is, everybody call him Bill Arnett, but I, you know, everybody call him Bill Arnett, but I know his name is William Arnett. And he were a person that would be the first person to take my works to some of the more higher intelligent levels outside of the museums, like the United Nation, or I'm having a, a flashback on a piece that's of mine that's in the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Uh, a piece that's in the Smithsonian, one of the pieces that I really, really love is yielding to the ancestor while controlling the hands of time. That piece itself talks about material that we are using and how we can keep on building and building and building and we can be trying to control the hands of time in the process of building, but if we don't be very, very careful in our sourcing of material or it can become some dangers there and we can make ourselves the target of that material. Uh, uh, yielding to the ancestors always, uh, me as an artist, I try to be thankful for my mother. My mother gave birth to 27 children out of 32 pregnancies. I give thanks and honor to my grandmother, my father's mother, and I saw some of her hard labor. And that's the, the end the things that we had to deal with from the cradle to the grave is mostly in the show. And that's what, if you look at the show, then come in and see what the students have worked with. Uh, it just totally amazed me what they did with all of this stuff so quickly and so brilliantly. The, the concept of we will walk it's a strong term. It's a strong term. Because the title could have been, We Were Ride, We Were Fly. But instead, we will walk. We will take to the streets. We will protest just to get human rights. We will take to the streets and we will walk. And we will take all the humiliations and whatever else, just for our babies and their babies to have the rights to vote. It's a whole lot of power behind these, this show. Not only I said these shows, but behind the pieces of art that has been chosen for the show. If I look at it in a panoramic view and try to come in a graceful manner of being thankful uh, for all that has participated. Uh, then I would have to say most of all of us humans that's in this We Will Walk exhibit uh, uh, have already died, they're deceased. Uh, but their art lives on. I think I did a piece called uh, The Instrument is a Scroll. That's a piece of music. The Instrument is a Scroll. Art, that's a piece of art about music. The instrument is destroyed while the, the music lives on. 
And in the process of that, having we been the instruments, the doers, and then we get too old and then we die. And then our art have been left as that that lives on. Well, the both of them, if you look at it, they put me in a category of information. Uh, as an informationer, uh, I think I'm much, much higher than the normal day of entertainment. I think uh, I'm more like a messenger. I try not to put myself in the process of, or have anybody to think I'm on that high scale of Jesus or the Dalai Lumber or the high priest or the whoever else, the God or whoever else that people have a tendency to try to believe in. But I'm more of the artist that was born and raised. You got to remember how I was raised. I was raised up with the landfill. My grandmother went there every morning that I knew her until she was in her 80s and couldn't go any longer. She went to the landfill. And she also dug graves until she was 82 years old. And she also worked in the march in, in the funeral home, dressing the bodies. And she knew all of these things. And she also, those same hands, because I, I have often I've seen about my grandmother's hand and how those hands that did all of this hard labor, picking with a pick, digging and a shovel, they came home and prepared a meal. They also, those same hands, made our bed and fluffed it our pillow. So if you just knew, if you, I did a piece in 1979, uh, uh, but it was a piece that had a pressure gauge, and I do a, a lot of placement, and I cut up some words and put in there, and I just took and opened up this big old veil and put the words, if you really knew. If we really knew the type of pressure, energy, that it takes for the human brain to actually cause the body to function for a lifetime. If we can learn to appreciate that and look forward to us giving birth to other generations, and saying, we have prepared a place for you. Not that I got to go away. I don't, I don't want nobody to think that I should have to die for you all to get an understanding of my work. I didn't come here for that. I didn't come here to make no art and go outside of the door and then die, and you all think I went to heaven somewhere. No, I think all of the participants in this show, why they were alive, and some of the G's being quilters, you're gonna see some of their works in there. I met some of those beautiful, wonderful women from the cotton fields or the fields, whatever the fields that were, from them going out, harvesting whatever the product were, uh, all the way until they got too old to even thread a needle, they can't see how to thread a needle, or they couldn't, they had arthritis in the hand and they couldn't push the needle any further through the uh, cloth. Uh, these are the exemplars of our artistic ability. I'm just the exemplar of what our inspiration can be. And that's with these little bitty objects that you see on the wall that the children have done here. And this ladder that you see right behind me, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful collaborated piece. And I think if at any time, if you all could come in and see these pieces and just give the, the children, I remember the G's Band quilters, we was there in G's Band and we was doing a recording there. Uh, I shared some time in a recording studio the G's Band Quilters sung a song called 
give us our flowers while we yet live. Why should we just wait and praise the dead? Why can't we praise these humans for what their brains have done while they lived? It's mama, my mama, my, my real mother said, don't be stupid. There's a lot of activities that we're doing now in the digital age, they are done out of stupidity. They are done out of hatred. They are done out of control, animosity, and jealousy. And I think that's wrong because if you look at how all of these humans in this, we will walk, we will walk together. I ain't going to let nobody turn us around. Turn it around. They lock their arms together. They walk together. They faced it the danger together. They got not only did they have the hose pipes uh, turned on on them. The dog was unleashed against them. Those people slipped up, bumped their heads against the wall. Sometimes that water would knock them down on the curve and bust their brains out. It was a whole lot of things that was not even because of control, media of the time, the, how the press was controlled. We didn't see actually what a lot of those humans had to go through in order for to make what we are, this we shall, we, we will walk. We will walk, honey, what you doing? I, you need to go in there and fix me something to eat. No, I'm going. I, I got to go. They didn't say we're going to go and walk. They said we're going to march. Dr. King have called for us to come and march, and we're going to march. But at home, there were friction also. Outside of that were uh, friction from the labor. And I still labor unions, <laughs> it's still the same thing. Labor unions that is fighting today to keep certain rights and certain rules and regulations from being written into law. Again, law. I think what I, we saw at a earlier visit when we came in, we saw this scale, a justice scale, you remember it? I think we need to go back and get that scale before I leave London and hopefully uh, do something, a work of art with that. Maybe I've been working and doing art all my life. I didn't know, it's, if you look at uh, my first opportunities to pick up something and examine it, I probably, as soon as I got out of the arm of a woman, and that's probably one and a half, maybe earlier than that, that they would allow me to just crawl around the state fair and the carnival. And in the sorts of material, you can just see, wow, wow. Each one of these things right here, they are so beautiful but to just remind me of humans' ability to express themselves or put things on exhibit to the point that these things can be awarded, a ribbon. They don't want to give us an, a, a ribbon for most of what we do as we achieve them. They don't, it's not even a ribbon. It's not that we want to get a Nobel Peace Prize like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. received just for guiding his peoples or marching and saying, let my peoples not go. But I think his marching was let my peoples learn. So for me, learning how to do art probably started uh, in while I was one and a half. I say two, three, four, all the way up, up and down the ditches when I got out of the door around four and a half, creeks and ditches, and then uh, laying back watching the 
they drive in watching all the movies and the projecting and listening at the sounds and everything. That's where my music and all the different types of sounds that came in, the actually the objectivity and its inspiration are seeing something broken but not the edges of it may have faces or may have slopes like mountains. I, I was quick to notice what was in the material before uh, I just passed it by and I, I still do that. A, a lot of times that get me in trouble because I, it almost make me late at what I supposed to be going to do because I get so fascinated with just seeing new objectivity or are, and it also be concerning me because I want to know what's being washed up on the shoreline. Because the first thing I saw, I didn't go all the way down to the water edge, but the first thing I saw in the midst of this material that is being washed up from the sea was some burnt debris. And I said, hmm. Because it made me wonder because otherwise, I know that people have a tendency to burn firewood along the beach, but there is also other things that has been burnt that has been washed off into the ocean, and it's traveling like the ships that you see and the boats. So these things, I'm continuing to do the same thing that I've done when I was a little bitty boy. It's, it's, it's not only me that has used materials that uh, we make art out of, but I think all the artists that you have in this show uh, have used different types of materials to express some point of view. The materials that I choose to use nine times out of ten has already been used by somebody. That means it has the spirit of that human, or him, her, boy, or girl. It already have been touched by somebody. So once you get that and you bring it together with other things like the ladder that's behind me, or, and you see all the threads and things that's on the ladder, or, the things that you see on the ladder are objects that we put there. Some of them have written words. Some is the paintbrush that has scoped and made uh, different colors on the ladder. Uh, the students that I was working with, I was asking them to give me, really because we have a problem with pigmentation. Uh, I think we the computer don't our data system, if we didn't tell the data system these different pronunciations, then the computer wouldn't know. I call a cold titty mama, computer technology management. It wouldn't know how to decipher or program the type of conversating that you want somebody to hear later. So these machines will not differentiate, they will not, one would say, um, what is the word, discriminate, because they are machines. This is the reason why I'm so afraid of what we are putting in as data of today, and how that data is going to turn around and make somebody look like a fool or make them look to be liars. Because once we find out that we have mispronunciated our programming for these computers, it's going to be like, wow, did they not think? 25,000 years from now, or 5,000 years from now, or 1,000 years from now, what would the humans consider once they go through this data? What would they think about this ladder once they go through the data? I really love that. 
what would they think about the ladder once they go through the data? That's going to be a song for me to sing. Are the two rocking chairs that's together, him and her, hold the root? Uh, is very, very powerful. The root itself can be indicating the DNA, can be indicating the ancestors, all the way down to the, the, the part of the root of now and the young growth of the root that is going to grow into uh, even, more, <laughs> even more possibilities of the human race. But the main thing is to know that that big old root that's in that chair came from one little tiny seed. The whole thing, I don't know whether anybody would ever look at it like that and say, wow, this man, he was thinking about this so empowerly that once he put it together, that he could not only be praising uh, his grandmother and grandfather and praising for what their labels had been about. Uh, the man's chair have a pillar in it of him and her hold the root. But the notable punch about it that I wanted humans to notice was that one of her rockers is completely broken off and one of his rocker, uh, the thing that allowed the chair to rock, is broken in two. But then when I placed the handle of hers up on top of his chair, then the both of them could rock comfortably together as they held the root. It doesn't mean that they had to be married. I think the whole thing with, the, uh, with uh, us as humans and us not seeing the man part or the woman's part the role that we have to play. We have to play that male and female communicating about what life is about. And I think that's where, if you say king or queen or queen or king, that part of decision makers, they have to be able to communicate together. I would just like to say I'm very, very thankful uh, for the opportunity to have been invited here. Thanks, Matt Arnett, for coming over and helping me uh, around the city, being more like the chauffeur for me. Uh, thanks to all that got behind this project and supported it. I think it's a project like this that really, really need uh, us to focus on them um, and do our very, very best with support. I, Jen Wright, Jen, I would like to thank Jen for her taking the time to walk up and down the streets with us and taking us to places to find things. Uh, Paul and Hannah, I would like to thank them for coming to America, first of all, and visiting and seeing what was in the William Arnett collection, talking with uh, Matt Arnett and Paul Arnett, and continuing to communicate as much as William Arnett could communicate about the art that they would be being lent and whatever other institutions. And I think this, because this is done in this black her history period of America, we call it Black History Month. But uh, to me, uh, what is history if it's not a seed? A history is a growing thing, so we must cultivate it righteously. What is history without a seed? Thumbs up for Mother Universe.